Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of The Overseers. I'm Pro Elias and I'm joined once again by Nightwing. You can say hi. What's up? And we have a third co-host joining us. Uh, this is 1HP guys, you can say hi to them. Hi guys, I'm 1HP. Basically you're a scuffed version of uh, all the analysts combined in current modern day Overwatch who don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> Yep, so a very warm welcome to 1HP. We are very glad to have him join us. And uh, for those of you uh, who haven't been following so far, we've been doing roster reviews for all of the Overwatch League teams, and this is our third one so far. Uh, so if you guys want to check out the previous review, which was about the Dallas Fuel or the Atlanta Rain, you can check it out on my channel. Uh, but yeah, like I said, today we'll be doing the Houston Outlaws. And... Uh, We'll be going over the tanks, then the uh, DPS, then the supports, and then touching upon the coaching situation, and then just rounding everything off, right? So, are you guys ready to go? Yeah, sounds good. Okay. Sure. All right, so let's start off with the tank duo. So, the Outlaws have picked up the tank duo from Talon Esports from Contenders Korea, and that is Jango and Piggy. So, based on the footage I've seen of these two players in Contenders, um, I would say uh, they could be an above average tank line in the league. Um, they aren't very well established, like not many people know them because Stalin isn't as famous as uh, some of the other more prominent teams like Runaway or Element Mystic. Uh, but from what I've seen, uh, Piggy is a really promising off-tank prospect. Uh, he plays really amazing Zarya. Um, he get, I haven't seen anyone probably since Sinatra build up graphs that quickly in the pro scene. Uh, and other than that, he's he's also played a brilliant diva from what I've seen. So, um, I think he could be like a dark horse off tank. He may go under the radar a little bit until we actually see his gameplay. Uh, but he's a really interesting prospect. Um, and his main, co-main tank, that is Django, uh, he's not quite as impressive. Uh, I've seen him play a little bit of Reinhardt, but that's about it. So, I don't have much to say about him. Uh, but he seems to be like one of those resource-heavy main tanks, kind of like Bumper. That's what he reminded me of, especially uh, except that he didn't sort of uh, play as if he, he was trying to int. Uh, the, other than that, without his team support, he would just die instantly, right? So I think he could be maybe an average main tank, but there's not really much to say about him. But I think Piggy is a really promising prospect. So um, do you guys have anything to add about the tanks? I'm just happy they got a real tank instead of hydration on main tank. <laughs> yeah, that's that's good enough. Um, I think my entire issue is uh, how outlaws are still being bold enough to go with an entirely new tank line. It's it's something that you know teams usually won't go for, and I would go as far as to say that initially when hydration used to keep subbing in for whatever reason for Muma. Uh, it wasn't quite apparent why Mumo was sitting out in the first place because truth be told he was one of the better NA tanks and especially after uh, years ago people like XQC had fallen off the scene he he was pretty much the most prominent person uh, in the uh, entire North America or the Northwest region uh, so the the issue that arises is that you would leave an established Winston player, probably top three in the world at that point in season two when he was still playing, to then go into season three to play a guy who's basically uh, a flex god. And it doesn't work out for you, even though you sign one of the best uh, off tanks in Mecco. And now you're going for another gamble where you've picked up you know sort of underutilized and rather under uh, underrated to some extent but we wouldn't know till they come into the overwatch league anyway so underutilized and i would say the other word to best describe them is just not not known well enough and it's 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 a lot of pressure coming into the overwatch league people get burnt out and the only thing they've got going for them in my opinion is of course like prolis mentioned Piggy's, you know, inherent ability to be such a good Zarya, such a good prospect, and probably their pre-built synergy, because that's that's one thing that teams don't normally look at, and I'm I'm glad they do. I think that that decision to pick them both up has a little bit of heart shy in it because he was the one who, you know, basically almost won a title with Vancouver Titans for no reason. He just literally picked up a pre-made team that had been just 
sort of vibing all these years, destroying other teams. And he knows what he's doing with it. And I think that's why the fans should trust them. But there will be little specks of doubts everywhere about this tank line because people, when they think main tanks, they think prominent names. And uh, it's, 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 it's a similar process with Yagpung and NYXL where you just don't know whether or not it's going to work out. But at least Yagpung is very well established. And when it works, his Reiner is probably, you know, again, very, very, very good at what he's doing so yeah i i don't know i i'd say sort of nervous but exciting for outlaws fans just uh, i i don't know if you know this but recently um harsha did an interview with i think gg recon or someone and um, he actually said that the decision to pick up runaway wasn't his uh in fact the if, uh, like if, if i'm um, misquoting him or uh if i've read this wrong just Forgive me, but um, based on what he said, he was initially still on the shock when he got the offer from the Titans, and he wasn't convinced that he entirely wanted to join the team. But then, when they said that, hey, we are picking up Runaway, and uh, then he sort of uh, that that's where no wait. I think he was already with the Titans, and then he wasn't sure if he wanted to stay. And then they said we'll pick up Runaway, and that's when he sort of joined. But basically, to sum it up. Picking up Runaway wasn't his decision, but he definitely might have gotten the idea from there, like 1HP said. Um, so yeah, I think that's pretty much... Do we, are those all the points on the tank line, guys? I think definitely, yeah, at least for me. Yeah. You think the tank line is going to have some issues communicating with the rest of the team? Considering that the DPS is mostly Western apart from Happy. So, But uh, the good thing about... Uh, what Outlaws are doing is, especially with uh, uh, picking up Jake and their existing staff also having experience with Korean players, is that a lot of, a lot of them speak Korean pretty well. So, mm -hmm. uh, even though there, there might be a cultural and a, a cultural ca clash and a language clash, I, I think they might be able to sort it out properly this time. Right. right. Yeah, that's a fair point, actually. And I think uh, let's talk about the DPS line now. Um, and I think let's start off with someone who's actually been a tank for the team but is now kind of officially confirmed to be back on DPS and that is Hydration. So what are you guys' thoughts on him? Do you think he's uh, going to be like effective at elevating the Outlaws play this season? Well, I'd, I'd say he's probably the most explosive player they've got on the roster. Uh, he's, if you will, other than Happy the only person who will make those plays because Dante, as, as good and as aggressive as he can be, he's more of uh, the tag for the most consistent player, if it, if you will. So with Hydration, my pet peeve has been that we know he can play main tank. We know he can do a lot of things, but just because he can doesn't mean he should, right? Mm -hmm. So that was a big, big enough coaching labs like last year and uh, I don't know what exactly went into making that decision because there's there's a lot of logistics there's a lot of uh, decisions that are made behind the scenes which may or may not make sense to people uh, who are you know sort of spectating as a third person but whatever whatever he did last season it, it, it should now be just you know put behind uh, all of their recent let's say losses because uh, I would say they, they went from uh, an almost top tier team in season one to, well, okay, they're average in season two. And then suddenly, you know, not even in contention, not, not scaring anyone anymore, not even making a point anymore. And I think most of the season, it was more or less, you just see plays from Dante and you'd hope that, oh, I wish they had proper, they had an actual proper flex because someone who could just, you know, capitalize on all the space he's making because he's honestly put dante is one of the if not the best traces on ladder so why why isn't he given just more space to work with one thing another that that, that people didn't understand was why linkser was so underutilized and coming back to hydration now being able to reprise his original role it's it's just I'm happy for him because that's what that's who he was meant to be when he used to play such good Genji and Farah in season one. People were, you know, raving about him. Nobody would stop talking about hydration. And there was this thing about how calculated his plays are usually. Hydration isn't very well known to be the most uh 
extending player. The, you know, he's not the type to just look for those extra seven kills, you know, after a team wipe. So it, it's it's not going to be an issue with them, and he's going to be great with Dante all around. So I'm just happy that as long as uh, I hope uh, the tanks can synergize with him uh, and Dante can create some space, I think Hydration is one of the better flex supports in the entire league because uh, people sleep on him because they've just not seen him play long enough. And I think, of course, uh, we have to fear the inevitable sort of, you know, him just being washed up or him just not having played enough in the role or just having carried that responsibility. But coming back to him being in his core module again, I think Hydration has the potential, at least under Jake, to be doing really, really well. Right, right. And uh, what do you have to say to that, Nightwing? Do you have any? Do you agree with uh, what One HP said, or do you have any different thoughts? Yeah, I mean, Hydration's solid. That, that's kind of the, the gist of that. I think he'll do fine. Uh, neither Dante nor Hydration are exceptionally resource-heavy players or exceptionally overextending or anything, I think they'll work fine with each other. So yeah, Hydration's solid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, based on what we've seen of him playing in, from like seasons 1 and 2, uh, I think his Farah and his Doomfist are probably two, two of the heroes of us that shown out to me the most, stood out to me the most. and. Uh, even when he flexed a tank, like I know he he wasn't the greatest main tank, and even I think that it was just it would have been better if they got an actual main tank to play instead of him last season. But he still plays a pretty good wrecking ball, I reckon, and that could be an asset to the team if uh, let's say Jangu wasn't able to fill that role. So, so I think it's uh, good that he's here. He provides a decent bit of flexibility to them, and yeah, let's see if he if he's able to perform well in the on the flex DPS role once again after like a, a small break of not being like actively playing the role. Uh, but yeah, I would, yeah, go on. I would probably assume that they're going to play him over KSF because uh, like even though he's out of the role for a bit, I, I think that hydration overall is a, a better flex DPS than KSF. And yeah, guess that's more for like uh, times when you'd, you know, you you when you need the May, when you need more of a junk rat. Uh, but I think when it come comes to like you know pure old school Farah Genji, or maybe uh, you need a very strong Doomfist like Trollio said, then as as you said, Nightwing, he's just very very good, and people have been sleeping on him all this time. Right. Or uh, if for some reason. Uh... Dante has to play some other hero apart from the Echo in a comp. Like, uh, if there's, they're playing Echo Tracer and Dante has to pick up the Tracer, then then they might uh, sub in KSF for Echo then over Hydration. But apart from that, I think, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Hydration is probably going to be their first go-to pick for Flex DPS. Mm -hmm. And since you mentioned Dante, let's touch upon him also a little bit because I think this guy's a goat, right? He's, um, he's probably one of the, uh, like, at least according to me, he's one of the most individually talented players, um, at least DPS players in the league. Uh, he's He plays like a phenomenal Tracer, he plays an insane Sombra, his Echo is god tier as we know. Uh, he also plays like a decent May when he has to. Uh, I, I think so far he's just been sort of a carry level player stuck in a bad team. And I'm not sure Houston knows how to utilize him at this point. I think they need to show him a little bit more respect and... Uh, because he's the, he's the sort of player you would want to build a team around, right? Because this guy is one of the most consistent players, like 1HP mentioned. Uh, and he's also got a fair amount of flexibility. Like, his raw mechanical skill is great and he's also incredibly smart. So, I would really urge Houston to try and get his team to play around him rather than uh, have him sort of fill in where his heroes are in the meta sort of but they still want to focus on the, the team as a whole and rely on everyone popping off uh, Do you have anything to say to that Nightwing? I think, or 1HP, whichever wants to go I think that Dante, why you think the team can't uh, seem to play around him is just because he he doesn't really demand a lot of resources the kind of uh, heroes he plays and the kind of playstyle he uses 
like uh, he can just like play off on his own and the team doesn't need to worry about him uh i think this this team is going to have a lot of other synergistic uh, issues especially with the uh, integrating the tight and tank line and i think that uh, putting it all uh, around dante i mean he he can be a player that is just consistent on the side right you don't have to build the team around him um but yeah he is an insane yeah, insanely talented player that's true mm-hmm. i mean i remember seeing him on the ladder and you know watching the streams back in like when he came <laughs> basically started overwatch after minecraft and uh you just see him playing and he's slowly climbing then he's suddenly okay top 500 okay top 10 okay he's rank 1 but you know that in itself was already a sign of things to come but you know you see people on the na ladder and you don't quite uh, take it to be as big of a thing as you know jonak having three or four top 10 accounts on the korean ladder but in essence dante is one of the most consistent tracers if you look at his pulse bombs almost never have i seen one being just just thrown out and you know not not getting a pick he just utilizes his resources so well mm-hmm. uh like nightwing said he's not resource intensive either so it's not like the healers will have to keep him topped up because of his experience primarily as a tracer player he also tends to play sombra in a way that's uh very alt economy based and he will always just focus on those singular picks that will win you the team fights that will give you an edge he knows uh you know this is this is very basic overwatch but in a high stakes game like in any overwatch league game people tend to forget that most 6v5s end up you know in favor of the team that has more players it's it's very very obvious but teams seem to forget that and dante's one of those players who's always looking for that one pick who's always in your backline who's always distracting someone so even if it isn't a 6v5 it becomes one in essence because two people are on dante and then it's suddenly a 4v3 and your tanks just you know they're they're gonna destroy you so the amount of space he creates is great for someone like hydration or someone uh, i i just want to see how ksf does because i i think they're going to use him a lot more on control point but that that depends on what sort of compositions like nightwing say they they would want to run with him but dante uh you know tldr he creates a lot of space he's very consistent you don't need to worry about him so we need the team to step up in the sense that they need to take advantage of someone who gives them that much leeway yeah very fair points and since you mentioned ksf as well let's touch upon him a little bit because um in in 2019 i think that was his first year playing in the league if i'm not wrong um yeah i think so yeah yeah and at that time he was playing hit scan for the valiant and they, i remember they had agility is on flex dps um at that time he played a really good bro he played a good hanzo so essentially he was known for his sniper play uh later on when uh, he played in 2020 he transitioned back to flex dps which is actually his his original uh, professional lo- role which is flex dps so uh, i don't think he stood out that much in 2020 but that could probably just be because ksp and shax were so explosive uh, but i'm not sure we are going to see ksf being played a ton uh, on houston's roster because there are already so many players that already play his role and probably better than he does so i don't see him as a high value pickup but i think he 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 could still find a niche in maybe like a double hit scan or a double sniper meta alongside happy where he could play let's say ash widow or hanzo uh but yeah overall i think maybe gusen could have gone a different route and saved his slot for somebody else uh, but i just want to get your guys thoughts on that uh, before i go any further okay i think that ksf uh is definitely a bit more sideline compared to ksp and sharks last year um they basically just most of the season valiant were just uh, running through with the ash racer comp and and ksf was just brought into play the the silly ninja hero uh occasionally and even then valiant would often just like not want to play the genji comp anywhere and just run with the ash racer mm-hmm. i think ksf i'm not sure what role he's going to play in the roster is just going to be a kind of a backup if if every other flex cps on the team gets boomed mentally maybe 
um or maybe they they use him to pick up new heroes or something while the rest of the team is constantly fielded in in scrims and matches uh apart from that i'm i'm not sure what role gives a full play but probably a pretty small role yeah yeah Yeah, I don't yeah. think he gets into the squad ahead of hydration, like you said, Nightwing. But uh, at the same time, uh, player burnout is a very real thing. It destroys teams mid-season, and we just don't know. At least with the pandemic, I know it's going to end soon. But let's be honest here: we didn't know it was going to last a year. So what do we know about the about the future? With two new variants out, and you just never know if there's going to be a fifth. So how I'm trying to put this is. Sure, he's probably not the most explosive player, but then Outlaws is not the type of team for explosive players anymore. Like, if they had to make use of those players, then they w- would have put, you know, Links or more in the first team last season. They just didn't want to go that route. That's also why they picked Mecco. Mecco wasn't the most uh, aggressive off tank, and one of the reasons he didn't pair well with Hydration is, you know, of course, one being that Hydration isn't a proper main tank. It was also that Mecco has always been known as. you know just being a god at peeling you would never let the nyxl support line die before himself it was very rare it was just a very good dps duo would have to basically distract someone to such an extent that meko somehow gets uh, involved in it and then you know you just kind of catch them off guard but similarly ksf is uh, he sees the type of player who doesn't need that sort of limelight i think shax uh, and ksp both were super aggressive and that's also why they went so well together uh, uh while ksf won't really be playing genji farah doomfist or any of those sorts ahead of hydration i can see a person like jake turning him into a specialist uh, we might see him exclusively almost play the widow or the may or you know maybe even he'll i think knowing how good jake is at the hero he might even choose him to play junkrat because you never know what uh the team decides to you know carry out specialisms for so just like uh back in the day and why and why used to sub in pine or you know suddenly soul dynasty used to sub in bunny for tracer only maps you never know how it's going to turn out so I think he should hope for the best and it's in hindsight looking back after what I've just said it's it's not such a bad thing to be the guy who's not under relatively a lot of pressure and who's always just brought in like okay come in do your thing and then literally just get out next map for the hydration again so I I think it's very interesting to see and um, I would have quite liked it if they had another person but uh, primarily a hit scan who is going to you know sort of because uh, well we will we'll come back to happy when we get to him but i i have my issues regarding him but as for ksf uh, as we were saying uh overall very good pickup but uh like you said not sure where he fits just hope houston have a plan in mind mhm let's actually move on to happy then if nightwing doesn't have any other points to add yeah sure um so yeah i think probably i don't have much to say about happy because i'm honestly a big fan i think he's a top tier hit scan player um he stood out on multiple heroes especially his widow uh which has been sort of one of the first things we noticed um as soon as the 2019 season began and they sort of pulled out triple dps his widow is insane he plays a good ash he plays a great hanzo uh he he's even not bad on tracer based on what we've seen um So yeah that's all I have to say about him he's pretty talented and I think it's a down good pickup by Houston. So yeah I'll let you guys take this one. What kind I of issues do you I have with Oh so yeah coming back to the issues. So like I was saying now look at their four DPS yeah. Uh they've got Dante reliable good mechanical skill uh, very reliable will never overextend hydration. good with mechanics can play a lot of things very reliable probably not going to overextend if you ask him to but happy literally goes against all that i've never really i have at multiple times seen happy for guangzhou literally go on a 1v4 or 1v5 flank i've seen happy take the craziest of routes and okay they work sometimes but if it was going to work now why didn't it work with linkser 
I don't see them utilizing Happy to his top potential. I think he would have been better suited on, on another team and for them to have had someone who's gonna be a little less self-reliant because uh, he's quite the opposite of other players. I have seen people like Chara on uh, Guangzhou devote an entire pocket session to him so he can get a few kills and sure he gets them. But then again, you're going to have to ask yourself a question like, where does Houston want to go with this? Who did they want to pair up with Happy? Uh, he's he's probably, I would say, mechanically their best player. But that's not enough. We've, we've seen that in many teams. That's many times it's not enough. It's, uh, you know, you could you could have the best hit scan on your team, but if he doesn't fit, he doesn't fit. So, like, it's, it's a very dumb thing to keep saying over and over again that I hope they have a plan, I hope they have a plan. But he's just their one pick who just doesn't conform to that uh, good old reliable standard because uh, he can be very good, but it just depends on what you give him to work with. So I am a big fan of Happy Like Trollius and, you know, every time he, he plays Widow, I wish we had that... Uh, all access pass last year because I would have loved to see in his perspective every game instead of just looking for replays later. Mm -hmm. So I've enjoyed his play quite a bit. I rate his McCree even higher than his Widow. And yeah. I would say that he can turn a single game around by himself. But what are Houston willing to do to ac accommodate for you know all the resources he needs and all basically He's going to provide you all of those things at a cost. The cost being uh, the pace at which your team plays. And uh, with teams like Seoul and NYXL having struggled literally all of last season because of issues like that. Well, Seoul picked it up in the end, but NYXL never did. So when you're swapping from a team that's playing more passive to a team that's suddenly going aggressive, you cannot have one guy taking all of the weight like NYXL used to with Pine. It's it's not gonna happen. So I hope uh, that Houston they have ha happy only in for times when they're like, okay, uh, this is control point. Let's say, okay, this is this is or this is a great video map or this has great sight lines. Let's put him in. Let's see what he can do and let's try to capitalize on it. But it's it's up to the tanks more often than not and it's going to be who he's paired with so i hope they they make a consistent pairing for him because for someone like happy it's very important that someone's taking a part of the burden off just because he can do it doesn't mean that he should have to do it by himself because what what the casters and what the analysts think think of a player like happy is when he's on the field he he should be making all of the plays and while he can it's impossible to give him enough resources to pull that off like you cannot just especially with role q coming in you cannot keep giving your uh hit scan especially uh all that window and uh all, such a heavy amount of resources to just go oh, okay do your thing but if you fail we're okay with it no you're not you're, you're never going to be okay with it you're gonna get snowballed and that's that you're gonna lose the lose the map very very quick so with happy it's a caution approach and my biggest concern is i love happy I also love Linkser, and I hate to see great players on great teams not being able to just play because of, you know, certain reasons like, oh, we didn't realize it didn't fit in. Mm -hmm. And I think I'll let you respond to that. Uh, I think Happy is a very good player mechanically, like you guys have said, but uh, I think he might have some issues adjusting to the team I think that's something that the staff can work on and uh, as for the play style differences and the kind of different positioning and uh, different style of play that Happy has I think that uh, the coaching staff is capable enough and th there will be enough communication to help them uh, set that up um, obviously it's something we'll have to wait and watch but I think that uh, happy can integrate into the team uh it's just that uh yeah he he does need a consistent dps partner to take some of that weight off that's that's a fair assessment mm -hmm. that's basically it okay so i think we can then move on to the final 
uh, I don't want to say player, but like a player coach, which the team has signed. A lot of people are excited to see him in the league once again, and that is Jake. Um, he's He took a break last year f- uh, from the league. We thought he'd permanently retired based on what he said. So he, he was a caster for the league, and then, well, he's back. Uh, so are you guys also as excited to see him as probably 99% of the Overwatch League audience out there? Um, I think that Jake <laughs> Jake entering back into uh, league play, I mean, as a player, uh, officially on paper, but from what they stated, as a, as a coach mostly, um, I think it's an interesting move. Um, he has been working on his kind of mentality, on his uh, coaching skill, on his uh, his outlook as a player as well as a coach. And and I think that in terms of going deep into a hero and figuring out how it how it works within a team as well as how you work individually, I think Jake is a is a good person to get get coaching from in both those aspects. Um, while I don't think he'll be making any roster decisions as a player coach, that will be mostly up to Junk Park, uh, I believe. Mm-hmm. Um, I think Jake can really help the micro of. Uh, micro play of the team uh, teams individual players improve i think uh, for example if there's a there's, there's a new hero that comes out or there's there's a new play style or a new comp i think jake is the guy to really uh, look at that comp grind it out uh, in in ranked play himself or look at scrims and and figure out what makes the comp tick and that, that's something that he can relay to the team very effectively Mm-hmm. Um, apart from that, I think he's he's not going to be a mainstay of the actual fielded roster. But I think that um, in terms of keeping the team's morale, the team's mentality, um, especially because now he's even learned Korean to to be able to con- communicate with both the Western and the Korean players. I, I think Jake is going to be kind of the face of the team in terms of. Um, the way Jake behaves is kind of what the Houston Outlaws do. Um, but apart from that, I, I think that uh, it's, it's a decent addition. I'm just curious if it will work out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because... I think if yeah, I think if anyone's going to make this work is Jake. Because, let's be honest, like you said, Nightwing, it's, he's not only is he quite good at what he does, he also is very adaptable. And, you know, on a related note, he also is so great at positioning. And that's something Outlaws work a lot on, considering the last few seasons, it's been quite a mess. And we just saw basic meltdowns from him while casting their game. So it, it was it was good to know that they used to have someone on their team with, with that degree of sort of like, you know, uh, he could assess play by play what was going to happen. I wouldn't say he was the most mechanically gifted, but even then, I think this is the perfect role for him where, where he's not quite a player, not quite a coach, but he's always there for the team. I think the team needs a leader. And uh, like, of course, you mentioned he picked up Korean as well. So that's one more bridge that he's, you know, sort of doesn't need crossing anymore. It's it's fine. It's fine for him. And uh, with Coolmat also sort of being having an influence over the team now, so it's it's going to be such a nice dynamic where the team has veterans who know the ins and outs of basic uh, tank and DPS play. I think they're probably not going to be able to help the support even one bit. That's that's just on the official coaches. But uh, when it comes to any other sort of positioning. Uh, stuff related to just basic game sense and why something is or isn't working i think they're one of the best veterans they could have paid for analysis mm-hmm. yeah all very solid points and uh, i think yeah he he should be uh he'll sort of fit a very unique position on the team as a player coach because uh i believe he, since he's already uh like prepared to be uh, like over on the side just helping train the players uh, he's not going to be spending a lot of time in scrims uh, if I'm guessing right and he'll also after a one year break uh, it, 
he might need time to get readjusted to the team environment, especially if he's looking to play in a couple of games this season. I think they might field him for maybe some easy wins that they see coming. Uh, but yeah, o- overall, it's like one year is a really long time for a player to be out of uh, pro play and then get back in after spending time exclusively in either solo or duo queue on ladder. Uh, but yeah, I think his... Uh, his coaching will come really in handy because he's been doing ward reviews for even contenders players uh, and pointing out some really good stuff there. I've, I've been watching his, uh, I've been watching all of his videos and analyses. Um, so yeah, pretty interesting addition. Um, and do we have any more points to add on Jake? Otherwise, we can move on further. No, I think I'm good. Yeah, no, we've I said think, enough. I think that the only thing I'm concerned about is whether the players will be receptive to Jake's feedback. Mm. That, that's the only thing. Because um, he's around their same age. He's around. He, he's supposed to be officially a player that's like them, except that he's a player that doesn't get fielded. So mm. so you can think about it in the, in the sense that there's a player who doesn't get fielded is telling you, a player who does get fielded, how to play the game, which hopefully does not create any uh, ego clashes yeah, I think that's just a point of morale, but as of now, we probably just don't see anyone who would sort of oppose to some, some something like that, because Dan is very self-kept, he, he won't really even need any help from Jake, but the kind of people who will, especially Hydration and KSF, uh, there we're gonna have to see a power dynamic from Jake where he takes over the room, and I think Jake has everything it takes to be a leader, in the sense that if you see his streams, if you watch uh, his... Uh, play-by-play explanations of some things and how he himself does things. He often explains his thought process going into it. I think he's more of a helper than someone who basically just gives you commands. So I think he has all the conversational tools to work with. And if Mm -hmm. he puts them to use, then even if there were to be someone with a heightened ego or someone who just very super competitive and doesn't want to, you know, uh, hear someone bicker too much, I think even then Jake's the sort of person you'll kind of respect in the sense that, okay, I hear you, I'll try that out. So, uh, I think Jake's the kind of person who can do it, if anything. Mm -hmm. That's fair. Yeah, yeah. And now let's move on to to talk about the support line, uh, which is Juby and Crimzo. Uh, So, let me start off by talking about Juby, which is their main support a little bit. so he's a relatively unknown quantity for most people uh, because he is like a very young and sort of um, inexperienced player um, to be very frank uh, he played he's been playing in collegiate overwatch uh, i think his most recent tournament was with hu storm which is a well-known collegiate team um, but he has played in contenders for a bit with second wind uh, he was just picked up after a really brief stint uh, with them which i think uh, speaks a little bit to his skill because coaches don't usually pick up players straight away from tier 3 or after spending let's say just a couple of weeks or a couple of months playing in contenders so i'm sure harsha and junkbox saw something special in him to pick him up uh, and uh, i think recently jake did an ama on his youtube channel um, and in that somebody asked him about juby and how he's sort of mixing with the team and how he's been playing so uh, from what Jake said, Juby plays a like uh, he's a really quick learner, um, but he still has a sort of a weak Brigitte, although he can play the Mercy and Lucio. Uh, but yeah, I could definitely see his point about Brig because um, when I watched Juby playing in Contenders for second win, uh, in it was uh, I don't know if you guys remember the double shield bad Brig meta, which we saw in the summer showdown and the countdown cup. Uh, right. But when he was playing with second wind, he he was actually playing BAP instead of break. They made the flex support play break, probably because he was so uncomfortable on the hero. So he, he he'd better sort of up his game because Overwatch League is at a, a higher level than contenders, and he hasn't even spent much time in tier two. So I think uh, based off of like combining the fact that he is inexperienced, but uh, the coaches still picked him up. I think he could. Be an average player, I think he's serviceable, uh, but we'll have to just wait and watch, right? Anything to add, guys? Yeah, I mean, especially considering that Crimzo can't play Briggy either, the, someone's gonna have to pick it up. 
uh, but if he's a quick learner maybe maybe it will be there in time mm-hmm. but apart from that like they, they do have a roster spot if they want to bring in one more support they maybe could like uh, i think that jubi will probably not not be at the top tier of supports but should be fine mm-hmm. i think considering before in the past they've had for some whatever weird reason we knew in season 1 it was bunny and boing and it always seemed very odd to me how the only real thing boing could really play was just lucia and with bunny was al- always that very reliable mercy i think he was quite a fine mercy but at least they have those both covered in jubi that's that's well at least one forward step uh in recent times i i cannot think of their support line standing out but uh, when at least they had rockus i i always thought of him as sort of being you know sort of the the main voice of reason on the team because he's he's always known his ins and outs now one thing about him having played jubi uh, by the way i'm referring to uh, on uh, hu harrisburg uh, is that uh, i think their coach is joe meister so at least uh, you could say he's, he's just very well versed with uh, right now the na scene and uh joe meister is like no slouch he's he's a, he's a very very old veteran of the game mm-hmm. and i remember watching him in the world cup he was himself quite reliable so what i'm trying to say is he might just be a low cost pick that that ends up working for them uh they're not necessarily taking a big risk but the brig like you said can be a big big problem uh they should uh while they still can have someone who just sort of specializes in just one or two or let's say even a flex support another flex if not a main support who can sort of play the big break to a very high degree or the bab to a very high degree but i think then crimzo has the bab covered anyway uh yeah jubi's jubi's not the not the best pick but he's definitely not bad we just can have to see how he gels in with the team and to what extent really the the team tries to sort of what are they going to go with in terms of their communication dynamic what what jacobs out for and uh who's probably calling this season is also a very good shout because we just don't know who the team leader is going to be because it's going to have to be someone who plays every game and then when you think about the tanks they're both korean so are you going to have uh, to you know give the helm to one of the tanks and then have them synergize because uh I don't know how they're going to make it work usually it just you keep that one guy like for example and we actually literally kept that one guy and now that one guy is probably going to do all the calling <laughs> so it's uh it's a very important dynamic of a team to realize okay he's the leader here and while Jake is very good you're not playing him so uh let's see what happens i mean very very interesting uh, in Jubi i didn't expect him to be picked up because I was one of those people who was like, "Jubi, I'm not sure if I." And then I read H U Storm, and I was like, "Yeah, Harrisburg, okay, okay." Because I heard of him, but it's like, no, I've never seen him play. So mm-hmm. because Harrisburg is, it's a collegiate team. They they don't really have daily streams or anything. I remember once we we had uh, yeah. our very own Indian team yeah. having <laughs> like. And we we got uh, royally outclassed, but yeah, it was expected. You're being too kind to the Indian team, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the the H U Storm were actually pretty pretty tough, but yeah, go on, go on. Yeah, so so Harrisburg's been nice. Uh, uh, I just think that uh, once again uh, they have a good coaching dynamic setup. I'm very interested, as you'll just obviously uh, move into talking about them. That uh, how they're gonna have two sort of co-head coaches i i know i mean it's 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 not harsh as was going to take the decision at the end of the day but uh it's still interesting how officially he's the you know he's co-coaching so i i, I don't quite know where he wants to go with that as a support though i think uh, jubi's can uh, as long as he adapts to crimzo uh, and the tank client is going to be fine i don't think he needs much synergy to go around with the dps mhm And yeah, let's let's then talk about Crimzo, uh, the final player in this discussion. Uh, he was with the Dallas Fuel last year. Uh, been he was being eyed for the Overwatch League for a really long time. Finally got the chance last year, uh, but you know we all know how it went with Dallas, right? Uh, complete implosion once again. Uh, but yeah, I'll let you guys touch upon how you think he's going to do in in this season. 
think that Grimzo, uh, uh I don't know if you guys saw the tweet from Grimzo about uh, how the guy that destroys your scrim, uh, that uh, destroyed every one of your scrims, then comes back and destroy your team, uh, feels horrible. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. Referring to DK. Mm-hmm. Um, if that's that's the kind of mindset that Crimson's is working with. So uh, hopefully, yeah, I think that's a, that's a great point, actually, Nightwing. That's something they need to really, really iron out of him for team role. I don't care. Listen, like as someone who's gonna manage a team, if I was Harsha here and this was gonna happen this year, like let's say someone leaves and then they end up on another team. It's it's the classic Fisher situation, isn't it? Like someone just goes to another team and then they destroy you and then you're just whining about it. Listen, I don't care. You're a professional. You're paid. You're not paid to whine about it. Like this is a very strong statement for me to say as a journalist, but at the same time, there's a degree of prof- professionalism. And of course, coaching decisions also go into it. So when you're expressing opinions online, uh, I don't really care about what he has said about DK, but it's more of like disrespect towards his own coach. Because when fallouts happen, it's mostly because it was either a coaching decision that sort of upset the player in question, or it was a team dynamic, or it was, you know, one thing or the other. And it's well known that sometimes core in players, they just can't gel well with the Western players. And they felt, feel left out, or they feel like the calls aren't being heard, or this or that. That's like... Fisher has done entire streams on how it works and how toxic the league has been to him. Mm-hmm. I mean, people usually see him as the kind of, you know, the the whatever the opposite of loyal is. So, <laughs> I mean, at the end of the day, someone like Kremza has to... It's fine, it was his first season. And Dallas is probably not the most stable team, the least, in fact. So, what happened with right now, you have to be like, okay, that was quite the experience now I have to redeem myself I think it's the proper opportunity and he has zero pressure on him especially considering that he's now on a roster people don't expect the world from he has a new tank line he has uh, a starlit DPS player and Harry coming uh, uh, happy sorry Harry's my friend well wow. so <laughs> <laughs> happy coming and then it's uh, it's it's very very uh particular how they chose to go with Crimson because I'd say I mean Zen and Anna talked here any day but uh, there were other options I, I'm not sure when they're going with Crimson whether or whether or not there was a specific dynamic they wanted to play him out with in terms of a Juby or if there's some coaching decisions they're gonna have to make to sort of uh, basically improve the positioning uh, Crimzo is a great player, don't get me wrong, but as as bad as Dallas was last year, it also kind of proved that he wasn't at the very top. So w- just like with most of Houston's picks, it's again one of those things where you just ask yourself, uh, well, you know, Houston's not really trying to compete. You look at Dallas picks and what they've done to the team this season, you know they're, they mean business, right? You know, most teams uh, that have at least rebuilt have had some sort of like uh, efficacy in terms of picking up players that have either just an insane amount of potential. Let's take Guangbung for NYXL or, Mm. you know, it's it's baffling to me how Houston, after all this time, whether I don't know whether they have just this insane belief in their coaching staff and Jake and Kulma coming into play now. Because your DPS can't carry you every game. So you're going to have to have at least a main or an off tank who's a star player or one of your supports. And here I'm I'm not seeing that yet. I mean, w- unless we just see Piggy become the next Janu, it's not going to happen. So it's, it's very, very particular how Houston have now gone again to being a team who by default everyone just expects to, yeah, yeah, they'll be middle of the table, I guess. And for me... Okay, that's good, but you have to see if the owner and management are... Why are they not being ambitious? There's there's no limitations to what sort of players you could pick, unless for budgetary reasons, but we've never heard of anything as such, at least with Outlaws, because let's be honest, they've got happy, and uh, it's... 
it's one thing to have flashy and good DPS players, and I mean, I quite like the DPS line. I'd pick them over many other DPS lines. So, Crimzo, while to me very good, uh, with Juby, we can give them the benefit of the doubt. Okay, he's he's unproven, but unproven also means that we just haven't seen him yet, and that that that's unlimited potential to me. And with Crimzo, it's about okay. Okay, maybe top five NA, but where are we going with that? Maybe not even top five NA anymore. So it's quite hard because the way Overwatch has worked in the past three, four years, monsters like you know Alarm keep creeping up, and then you just have to ask yourself: Is my flex support good enough? Because if Jonak starts to look like a guy who's suddenly top three, then the league is in big trouble of having quality flex supports because there's too many of them. And that's a dynamic where I don't see Crimzo winning them fights or Crimzo being the hyper aggressive Discord bot or Crimzo being the person who's just like, oh, watch out for that play because he's going to make it. Because that's not happening. Every great team in the league has a great flex support. And that's it. That's like one role that has always been consistent with great teams. And we have had absolute legends like Jae Hong Ryu and you know we've we've had up upcomers we've had so 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 much potential in there so crimzo is great but it brings me back to the point where i'm like uh with the tank line the support line is houston just hoping that their coaching and uh, all of that stuff can sort of take these uh let's say mid table players and just, just bring them to a degree where they're competing with the top end because I, I, I honestly don't think they're going to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't really think they're aiming to be right at the top. I think the team is, like you said, it's, it's kind of middle of the pack, probably, uh, just as Houston has been for most of its existence. And uh, as for Crimson, have you guys seen the, the SpongeBob meme where it's like, uh, how many times do I need to teach you this lesson, old man? Mm-hmm. Uh, it, yeah, it's yeah. like, yeah, it's like uh, Crimzo's men- mental is is going through the same thing. He's going to an- another disappointing uh, uh, Texas-based team, and <laughs> he's gonna have another fusion of uh, Korean and Western players, and uh, it's gonna take a lot of effort from all the staff to not break his mental because I think it's almost inevitable that mm-hmm. issues will arise, especially considering that we're still in a pandemic. There's still uh, a lot of mental boom going on in all of the players' minds. So many of them have considered uh, retiring, uh, even if nobody comes out and says it. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and and I think that uh, staff is going to have to work hard to avoid that situation, especially with players like Crimzo. Right. Yeah, I think uh, Crimzo, definitely the point of the mental comes in, but... Uh, Let's say the team performs better than he expects it to be, right? I think uh, he's already sort of a consistent player, even if he isn't really bombastic. Uh, But I think he could be sort of a middle-of-the-pack flex support when you compare him to the the rest of the market. Um, But yeah, that's all I have to say about him, honestly. uh, Because you guys said pretty much all the remaining points. Uh, But yeah, should we move on to the coaches then? Oh, yeah. Yep. Right, so this is a little bit of a unique situation because uh, we've got two head coaches with Houston uh, and that is Harsha and Junkpuck. So Harsha has been with this team since season 3 began uh, or rather the preseason of season 3. Uh, we saw him do really good work with the Titans as an assistant coach but uh, he didn't do much with the Outlaws when he got here uh, because they still remained... Uh, an unimpressive team, right? Uh, So, they kind of probably had a junk bug to add that sort of more experienced and uh, sort of like uh, someone else who has learned with Krusty, right? Uh, So, junk bug has been working with Krusty for a couple of years now and he's a great addition to the lineup, I think, uh, because... He's he's worked with like goated players. He's worked with like probably the greatest coach we've seen in the Overwatch League, 
um, but I don't know if it's a good decision appointing him as a co-head coach with Harsha because having multiple head coaches is like you know opinions can differ and if you're going to have differing opinions at the like topmost tier of play uh, that's a really risky gamble so I'm not I mean, a fan of this move but yeah you yeah you know. we, we we've already seen it twice uh, first of all it was Pavan and uh, Wizard Young and then it was Pavan and IMT and like so what the head coaches no. they were co-head coaches or yeah, uh, I mean, they acted as co-head coaches even if they weren't on paper. Uh, one of the biggest right. problems with the team uh, coming out, uh, like the end of the first season was basically just a weird parallel where Wizard Young used to go off his databases, which is basically a joke at this point, <laughs> because he's just so well known for, you know, making notes of everything and then just taking a very, very methodical and by the book approach to coaching where uh, Pavan was more of a, okay, learn by rote, doing doing your normal training aspect, and then, okay, does this work, does this not? He was more of a by method. So it was more of a statistician versus a coach brawl for NYX in the first year. And while that is concerning uh, in co-head coaches, I don't see that uh, being as big of a problem here as long as... They keep a clear parallel between uh, Harsha and uh, the current head coach Junkbug because Junkbug has basically been on the best team, and uh, it's not it's not like the best team was even close. They, they've been the best team by far, shock. So. Mm -hmm. I think if anyone knows how it's done, it's him. And if anyone knows player management, it's Harsha. So as long as they keep Harsha like less than 20% focused on the actual coaching aspect and just way more focused on maintaining player morale and uh, how they're being uh, managed on a day-to-day -day basis, whether they're happy, what they need from the team, whether the communication is being done, stuff like that. Very essential quality of life stuff that gets overlooked in esports and uh, has... Uh, actually made people think that why are there player organizations to sort of battle it if someone isn't taking the helm uh i think as long as they they keep that little bit of distinction between two people you know who are co-head coaches it's it's going to be wonderful for them but my 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 problem with all of it is that they've got a top tier player manager in harsha and sort of a coach and then of course junk buck is great but uh, their picks i don't know i i'm hoping junk buck had a huge role in who was picked up and who wasn't but uh, i hope uh, he wasn't denied any of his picks to make the ones he did uh, for the tank and the support lines because their dps are great like i said and this coaching line is great if if the distinction is well maintained mm -hmm. within their roles what are they trying to go for is something i'll never understand that's been an eternal question of mine with houston what do you want like mm -hmm. season one stage one you were probably a top three top four team and uh season two stage one you were still a top five team season three we were probably saying you you probably end the season you know middle middle of the pack it wasn't much different from it and season four, it's going to be, what do you want? Like, at this point, you have to ask yourself as an organization that has just rebuilt, you can't be rebuild every year. So that's one point. And you've had to rebuild uh, around one of your star players. And I am seeing it clearly that you're banking on potential. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. But does that mean more or less uh, of a pressure on someone like Junkbug because he's going to have to do most of this alone. Uh, because let me be honest, Harsha has definitely been picked up because of his player management skills. Because uh, at least at the start, Titans was a very close team, not because of their past association, because of how good they were treated and how their needs were met, their salary needs and everything and this and that uh, from uh, the owning organization and uh, of course it fell out ugly uh, which nobody liked to see because 
seeing as the real Jihong had joined them, it seemed like him and Haksal would have been a very good dynamic together. But let's never, let's not walk down a path that was never gonna end. So it was for me. It's a very confusing decision. You've got top tier coaches now. You've got great DPS. One of them, which you've built the team around now. Uh, you've got. Possibly questionable player choices. I'm, I'm not going to question them. I respect all those players. The, those are very hardworking individuals. And in fact, like you said, Kremzo, he's not explosive, but he's consistent. And consistent is exactly what Houston stands for. So are these coaches going to turn this consistency-based team around into players that are so well-versed with their roles that they're, they're at least competing in the top six because now even top six, top five is a big deal in the Overwatch League with the number of teams uh, now. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have to wait and watch if, first of all, like you said, the co-head coaches clash at some point, which I don't think they should because Harsha isn't the most technical of coaches. When he's being a coach, he's being more of a manager. He's being more of a person who takes the helm at the interim where basically Junkbug has said his thing and he's just following up on it, making sure it happens. And he's just making sure everyone's fine with everything. Uh, I hope that element stays. And I also hope that Junkbug got to make a lot of these player choices that have been made. I'm just basically repeating my, myself at this point for the second one. So uh, good luck to them. But Houston, please tell me what you want. That's that's basically it for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you have to say about this, Nightwing? Yeah, I think the team's objective is a, is kind of confusing, but also I, I feel like um, they, they are going to be middle of the pack regardless of what the objective is. I think the co-head coach uh, thing shouldn't be too much of an issue. I think Harsha and Junkbuck will probably be able to work together well. Uh, considering both of them have worked for uh, Shock in the past as well, and like it should be fine. Uh, I think that uh, mostly it's just uh, the roster that that is a little bit underwhelming and is probably not at the same level as some of these insane rosters at the top. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think Houston is just trying to ride out the season with. Some some picks that one might consider budget, and other superstar picks which are their franchise players like Dante. Um, I think they're just kind of maintaining the brand with a with a few iterations here and there. Uh, but yeah, all the best to them. Uh, I I really want to see what what difference uh, the the coaching from Jungpa can make to this team, because you've seen some of these players be. Uh, players be kind of disappointing um, in previous seasons, but with a coach who has studied under Krusty, such as Jungpuk, I, I think that uh, I want to see these players really pop off. Apart from that, I think, uh, go yeah, just good luck to them. That that's it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, we've touched on pretty much all of the players and well, the coaching stuff in question. Um, but yeah, I think let's uh, let let's quickly try and answer this question: Are the Outlaws actually moving forward in the endeavor to climb up in the league's rankings, or do you think they need to do more in order to, you know, get where they need to be? Okay, do do I take this one? Um, I think that uh, Outlaws are trying to improve. Definitely, you can see they've brought in significantly better coaching. They've got got uh, better players in, I think. Uh, I mean, if nothing else, at least their tank line will be an improvement from last year. Un unless somehow Jangu manages to be worse than Hydration on main tank. Uh, but it's it's just that the rest of the league is also trying to improve. Um, and they're, they're iterating over and over again. And I think the that Outlaws may be falling slightly behind. Uh, uh, or maybe right on the cusp of the the rate of improvement of the league, and so the, at the end of the day, they're gonna end up middling as usual. Mm -hmm. I think the kind of playstyle they wanna go for is the only justification, in my opinion, for some of the picks they've made uh, in terms of having a top tier coaching staff. But 
somewhat not satisfactory names being picked up for uh, the support and tank line. But I think that's what they're going for. They've identified with uh, veterans like Jake and Coolmat that what works for them and what would work around someone like Dante or Hydration. And at the same time, they've wanted coaches that would bring the best out of it. Uh, compared to last season where they didn't even know what a main tank was, <laughs> that is uh, quite an improvement. So uh, all the power to them. And I hope to see a better battle for Texas because we haven't seen any decent ones since the first year. I mean, it's always close, I'd say. It's always close between them historically, even if it's either a wipe or very close between Houston and you know uh, Dallas. And I just always prefer it to go to map five and it's just, you know, a very, very toxic game. I just love stuff like that. So I'd prefer that they have the same ambitions Dallas is showing this season because I think uh, after what happened with Envy and this and that, and then uh, it's just uh, when you think Dallas, so much controversy comes to mind. So I'm just thinking about it now and... I know Dallas is moving forward. Houston should as well. And this is definitely answering your question finally. Uh, a definite step up. But I'm not sure in, in what what regard. Uh, because it, there's a slight, slight sense of sort of direction. But uh, yeah, with coaches like them, uh, they can only go upward. I can't see them doing any worse at all uh, compared to last season. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think uh, based off of where they've been, uh, like how the track record has been, which is like a relatively inconsistent team, not making very intelligent roster decisions. I think if they just circumvent all of that, they can be competitive in this season. I, do, I don't think they'll be a championship contender. Uh, but as long as they try and stay consistent and don't like force their players to make unnecessary flexes like just put hydration still on Reinhardt or something like that I think they should be fine and they will be moving forward and I especially want them to be um, a little bit better for the passionate fan base that Houston has um, I don't necessarily support each team but it seems like Houston has got a, got a lot of love and support for the outlaws so I really want uh, this team to perform well for them you know it means a lot to them that this team do well and personally I think uh, I want them to succeed a little bit more for Dante because, like I said, he's he's been a sort of a carry level player, but in a weak team. So it would be great if this guy saw some success in actual professional play rather than just being recognized as a really talented individual player. Um, so yeah, any f final thoughts? Because I think we've covered pretty much all of the topics we needed to. No much. I th I just think that uh, the best case scenario for a team like the current Houston pickups and coaching staff would be to end on a note where Hangzhou Spark have been ending the past few seasons, where they're not quite the best, but they're definitely well within contention in the sense that okay, they're a team that can on their day upset anyone, and I think that's sort of the best thing they can try and go for. Even that. But, you know, the way I see it, the way my analysis goes, it's it's going to be very hard to even keep that up. But uh, if it everything falls into place, then I think that's going to be our best case scenario. And best case scenario may be a bit lower than the middle of the pack. But I don't think the, the second, the latter is going to happen. So, yeah, definite improvements over last season. Definitely a bit impressive. Something's questionable, but good luck to them. Mm, I think... Uh, yeah, that's about it. I think their ideal case scenario would be to um, lose gracefully to Atlanta. <laughs> that's the way I think about Houston. Like, play play a decent game against Atlanta, but lose. That, that's probably where they should be, ideally. Uh, we'll have to see how the year pans out for them. Good luck to them. Okay, so I think that about concludes this episode of The Overseers. Uh, if you guys have any questions about this episode, feel free to post them in the comments. As long as they aren't about the scuffed Harsha information I gave in the beginning about that whole Vancouver Titans thing, uh, I will try and link that article in the description so you guys have an accurate picture of how exactly that interview went. But yeah, if you guys like this video, be sure to do everything to contribute to the 
to this video popping up in everyone's recommendations which is like comment subscribe share um if you guys want to uh join my discord i'll uh, put a link in the description for that as well uh, we have a lot of overwatch league fans over there that you can interact with it'll it'll be really cool um and yeah what which team do you guys want to talk about in the next episode because we haven't actually decided yet uh well we've talked about both the texas teams mm -hmm. i kind of want to talk about uh <laughs> since you talked about how crimson was uh, upset at a uh, certain someone I, I want to talk about where that so, so, so certain <laughs> someone has gone yeah so i want to talk about washington and and see what dk is doing with that team okay sure oh yeah, yeah that yeah. that would be yeah, that would be nice actually i agree Cool. So then, the next episode will be the Washington Justice. Remember to subscribe if you want to be notified about when that video comes out. But yeah, until then, that's all. See you guys in the next one. Bye bye.